like, uh, like uh, screen media has uh, really taken over the lives of young people. But what has become, what's normal? What is typical these days for, for screen media time? Well, the um, uh, studies uh, have been looking at and interviewing thousands of uh, young people and their families and, and doing so every five years or so. And when data from 2000 is compared to 2019, um, it was found the average screen time that young people are engaging in has roughly doubled during that time. Um, so, and the biggest uh, increases, of course, are time spent online and time spent in video games. And in recent years, uh, watching online videos uh, like YouTube um, has, uh, um, has been the biggest increasing area. TV time has actually gone down a little bit, but these other, time, these other activities, uh, social media among them, has, have really uh, replaced it and, and burgeoned um, the total amount of screen time so that your average um, a child spends nearly five hours a day on screen media. And this is not for school, but just for entertainment purposes. Um, and teens spend even more, uh, an average of well over seven hours a day, which over the course of a year amounts to more time than they're spending in school back when they were spending time in school. And, uh, and so, so really um, uh, the screen media has really um, uh, come to dominate the free time of, uh, of, of kids and especially of teens. And the COVID uh, crisis and the quarantine has only increased uh, this effect. Some studies show a near doubling again for many kids um, uh, and teens of the amount of time they're on screens to really come to dominate their entire day. Um, so, um, so this this issue certainly um, hasn't uh, um, isn't disappearing. So, what is it that they're doing on online? Well, this is um, you can see a graph here of of tweens and teens, and both of them are spending most of their time watching TV or online videos. That really is what they're doing most of the time. With video games taking on a significant chunk, uh, more significant for tweens, you see, than uh, for teens. With the rest, um, uh, they're also teens have a significant uh, portion, 16% spent on social media, and the rest sent, uh, um, is divided between content creation, video chat, and that kind of thing. Um, but mostly uh, videos and, and gaming with teens spending some significant time on social media. So, uh, so what we've seen really from my generation when, when we spent our time, um, uh, you know, on, on, on the streets and the fields, um, uh, playing pickup games outside, largely outside, we've seen childhood and adolescence really move inside and, and onto screens. Um, and, uh, and, and many people, um, many adults kind of don't really, um, uh, aren't, uh, um, aren't as enthusiastic for technology might find themselves wondering why, you know, why would young people want to spend every waking moment or nearly every um, moment of their free time on screen media. And I'm going to take for an example of video games um, and talk about a little bit about what makes video games so habit forming. Um, for those of us who aren't gamers might, you know, might have a really hard time uh, understanding. Well, of course, um, pretend and fantasy play is such an important part of development. Um, and, uh, and, and it has really been co-opted, uh, imaginative play has been co-opted in large part by, uh, by video games. Um, here we have um, uh, Ralphie who wants to get uh, a Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas. Why does he want to do that? So he can imagine that he's a gunslinger, right? or a cowboy. But of course, these days, kids are much more likely to want to jump on to um, a Call of Duty or, or Grand Theft Auto, because these games um, provide a, um, a, a very engaging and, and sometimes very realistic simulation of, uh, of just that. In, in essence, they do the heavy lifting of imagination for kids. Now, the downside is the kid doesn't exercise their imagination or really put very much of themselves uh, into the play as they would with imaginative play. But, um, but really, uh, video games have come to co-opt um, pretend, uh, pretend play. Um, video games have also become the ultimate form of escapism for so many young men, many patients that I see. And every once in a while, I'll get a, um, a young man who will tell me, I, I hear this uh, once in a while, who will say, you know, I'm really no good at, at real life. You know, I'm, I'm good at video games. That's what I'm good at. And, and video games are very um, 
are very good at making players feel successful. Um, and and on, on, in the video game world, you can be pretty much anyone you want to be. You can be beautiful, you can be powerful, you can be influential, you can be successful, and you can feel a lot of things that, that many young people find it hard to feel in their everyday life. Um, and when they engage in uh, the fantasy of video games, really it, it, it's, it's an amazing form of escapism because the video games are so engaging that, you, that they really um, uh, aren't thinking at all about their real world problems, which can be good in the short term. In the long term, sometimes that can create more problems. Um, another thing about video games that's important to understand is that unlike traditional forms of entertainment, video games have no stopping cues. Uh, most of them don't at any rate. So we think about um, reading a book. Books have chapters for a reason, right? Um, so that there's a natural you know, uh, time to, to, to pause and decide. You can keep reading, but it's a natural stopping point. Similarly with television shows these days, of course, we can binge watch our shows on Netflix if we wish. However, there's a natural stopping point. And many, um, uh, many of the contemporary video games take hundreds of hours to, to complete or they never really can be finished um, and, and oftentimes lack these uh, natural stopping points. So, so video games often fo form what uh, behaviors call a compulsion loop. And this is what a compulsion loop looks like. And essentially when you're playing the video game, a lot of times um, it isn't just, um, uh, uh, well, a lot of times it really resembles work because what players are doing is they're actually working towards goals and they may have many different goals they're working towards at the same time. They may be working on getting enough Xbox gamer points, trying to show off, show off to their buddies. They might be trying to um, uh, do a number of things, but the most common being earning in-game currency. Right. So as you play, um, as you grind, as, as gamers call it, a lot of times you're working to earn in-game currency. Now, what's that for? Well, you might uh, decide you might uh, earn enough in-game currency to level up and to get a new ability, right? Like the ability to be sneakier and to sneak around uh, more effectively. So let's say you're playing for an hour and you finally, after all this time, you achieve your goal. You've earned the in-game currency. You finally have this new ability. Now, is this natural stopping point where you'd wanna sort of turn it off and go to bed satisfied? Not really, no, because you just have this new ability. Now you want to test it out. Now you want to play with it, see how it works. And as you continue playing with the new content, you're drawn into new goals. Like if you just had that other ability that you could, you know, uh, kill people even faster when you're being sneaky, now, now um, uh, uh, you'd really be doing well. And so, again, no natural stopping point, which is why video games form uh, something of a compulsion loop. And Related to that, video games are very good at putting users in a state of flow. Now, you might be familiar with flow. It's a mental state of just being fully engaged in what you're doing, totally focused on what you're doing. It's a very rewarding and engaging place to be. Um, and you might hear about athletes who talk about that when they're in the zone or artists who get their best work done when they're in this state of flow. And in my opinion, there is no other activity that is better at um, at catching players and keeping them in the state of flow. And that's because flow doesn't happen by accident typically. It typically happens when your uh, skill level at doing the activity you're currently doing matches up just right with the level of challenge of that activity. So in other words, if a activity is too hard for you or you can focus on it completely and you're still gonna fail most of the time, that is anxiety provoking or frustrating. Uh, certainly no flow there. Uh, if you are engaged in an activity which is too easy for you, where you can be successful, you know, even while barely thinking about it and the rest of your mind is freed up to wander, that can be boring. It's only in this certain Goldilocks zone when you have to focus completely to be successful but if you do focus you um, completely, you are likely to be successful. That's when flow is possible. And video games are very unique in their ability to challenge players at just that right Goldilocks level. And video games are also good at teaching players to be better gamers at that game they're playing. So what happens as the skill level increases, um, the game is very good at, at commensurate increase in the level of challenge and complexity. So players are usually kept somewhere in that zone of flow. So what does that look like? If you have kids who play video games at home, 
you probably know what that that uh, what what flow looks like. But if you don't, um, there's a photographer who takes some pictures of kids who are in uh, playing video games, and I thought I'd share a couple of them with you. So you can see he's really focused in on what he's doing, almost a glassy uh, stare. Um, similar here, uh, very focused. He's my favorite here. He's all in, I think. And and this last kid, I think, is on the verge of something really great here. He's uh, uh, There's something going on there. Um, so um, another thing I, I want to mention is that video games also serve psychological needs that we all have. Um, and of course, um, we know from Maslow that, that people have a hierarchy of physical needs, but people also have psychological needs. And according to self-determination theory, the most important of those are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So autonomy, of course, is the need to have control over the course of our lives. It's the opposite of feeling helpless. And, um, uh, and during the day, you know, most of the time, kids and adults from that, that part are, have a set schedule about where we're supposed to go and what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to behave within certain parameters. And even in traditional forms of entertainment, like reading a book or, or even watching a, a video on, on, on YouTube, um, uh, there's not really a lot of control that players have over the course of the action. You know, or I say players, excuse me, viewers, you can choose to, you know, what book you want to read or what video you want to watch. You can pause it or reread a section, but really, you know, the story is set. That is very different in the world of video games. Many video games these days are set in these open sandbox worlds, which are there for players to explore and make of what they will. Um, and that means the choice of what challenges to accept, of how to overcome those challenges, of where to go, what to do, uh, whether you want to be a good guy or a bad guy, the choice of success or failure, everything is in a player's hands. This here is an Xbox controller, which resembles the PlayStation controller. You see that it has about 20 buttons uh, that are supposed to be used during play, and your average gamer can press buttons about five times a second which means that in any given second, there's over a million different combinations. Just to show the minute amount of, of control, the incredible amount of control, sorry, that, that players have over the minutest elements of, uh, of games. So video games really fill this need for autonomy. Video games also fill the psychological need we have for competence. We all feel the need to feel effective in dealing with our environment. And video games are very good at making players feel confident. As I mentioned, video games are very good at challenging players in a very real way, where you have to focus and put effort forth if you're going to be successful. But when you are successful, it really is, um, uh, um, uh, it feels good. Um, uh, which is why when, when my wife let, reached 100, level 100 in Candy Crush, she really felt like she'd accomplished something, where I felt like she just wasted, you know, several hours uh, of her time. But she didn't feel that way. She felt confident. Uh, video games are also good at making people feel related or connected to other human beings. Um, uh, and of course, you would think the last thing someone's doing while they're playing a video game on their own is feeling connected with other human beings. But... Studies show that interacting with video game characters, these aren't other people playing, these are just characters in the game, interactions actually make players feel less lonely than if they were watching a television show or reading a book. And of course, um, many modern games like Fortnite instantly introduce players to 99 other players who want to either compete with you um, to reach, um, uh, uh, to reach uh, goals or uh, cooperate with you to reach mutual goals. Um, and so, and, and, and ch with chat function enables, there is a real, if limited, uh, connection that video game provide, provide. So video games meet this need we have for relatedness. Now we'll get to this later, but it may not surprise you to find out that those who play the most, those who spend the most time playing video games, it actually ends up being counterproductive because gaming addicts, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, actually feel less competent in real world skills than their peers. And of course, this is, makes sense that they've been devoting so much of their energy and time to their video game skills. Um, uh, uh, gaming addicts also feel less socially connected to their peers. The video games do provide this connection, but it's not you know, one that is ultimately fulfilling or long lasting for those who play excessively. And they also feel less control over their lives and less meaning in their life. So in the short term, video games um, really meet these needs, but in those who play excessively, ultimately 
uh, counterproductive. Of course, uh, these games are so engaging. Uh, there's, this is no accident, right? They are engaging because they are designed to be. The video game industry is a $200 billion a year industry. And this money is going into making player, into getting people to play games and keeping them playing. And there's a whole field of psychology called behavioral game design that is focused on just that. And using, um, uh, all sorts of tricks, uh, psychological tricks, to get uh, players playing and keep them playing. For instance, variable and fixed ratio reinforcement. So these are like um, uh, treats that you get while you're playing the game. Fixed ratio reinforcement means that if you play a game like Assassin's Creed for about an hour, you know that roughly every hour you're going to level up. And when you level up, you're going to get a new ability, you're going to get this little reward, right? Um, but there's also variable um, uh, ratio reinforcement. And am I going to? No, no. Variable ratio reinforcement are best um, uh, are best um, uh, embodied in these loot crates that you may have heard of. So you're playing Fortnite and um, and you win. You win a loot crate, right? You have no idea what's in this loot crate. It may be something you already have, or that's just a mild level up, or it may be something truly special, something that only comes along in one every hundred or even once every thousand games um, that is going to set your character apart in a major way. And many of the items that can be gotten in these loot crates can actually be sold for real world cash to other players and, and technically meet the definition for gambling. So, um, so video games, and, and a lot of what I've talked about really does des um, describe YouTube and social media as well, but, but video games can be like, uh, or these loot crates in particular, can be like, like a slot machine, right? You pull the lever and who knows uh, what's gonna happen. So very, very um, uh, engaging. This is the uh, research labs over at Microsoft, but the truth is that the ultimate sort of lab these days is every living room uh, in America, essentially, because these video games, whether it's on the phone or the Xbox, are now all connected online and are constantly feeding back information to the game developer about how you play the game, what gets you to play more, what gets you to stop, so that these games are constantly updated and patched to make them more engaging, more fun, but also more habit-forming. All right, so I talked a lot about how these games are so incredibly engaging, um, but what happens when it's time to stop, right? I think every parent knows um, uh, uh, what happens, but, um, but when kids are really engaged in a video game, it can be a little jarring uh, when they have to stop, and of course parents know this, but uh, Jimmy Fallon asked parents to turn off their kids' uh, Fortnite game, and I wanted to share a couple of those with you just to give you a uh, taste of that. I'm going to skip this first one here. Sorry about that. Oh, are we supposed to be seeing We're something, seeing Dr. Blanco? Sorry? Are we supposed to be seeing a video or something? Oh my goodness, you cannot see We're, what I, you can't no. see. The, oh, Did I'm so sorry. I am sharing the screen. You can't see my screen right now? I can see your screen, but... It's a still? It's a still slide. It's just a slide. I see. Well, I'm so sorry. You got you didn't miss out on much. Let me describe to you uh, what's in the video. So essentially, um, parents come and turn off the, uh, uh, the video game, and, and kids react um, in extreme ways. They, they curse. Many of them attack their parents, hit their parents. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and essentially throw uh, tantrums that one would not expect uh, from their age, from their teenage. So I'm so sorry that my uh, video didn't work. C uh, can you see the slide with the sumo wrestler on Yes, it? yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move on then. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep the videos for, uh, for tonight. Sorry about that. It's always embarrassing when the so-called tech expert, you know, uh, um, uh, can't get the, uh, the AV stuff to work correctly. I apologize for that. Um, 
at any rate, so um, uh, so uh, my point is that 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 these technologies can be so engaging that um, that that oftentimes they really overpower um, the willpower of kids and and their parents, quite frankly. And if we expect kids to uh, many kids to sort of control their own media habits um, when they're faced up against this, you know, again, hundred billion dollar industry we may be expecting too much. This may not be a fair fight. So, uh, so how does all this screen time affect mental health? Uh, well, it's not a simple uh, relationship, but here we see mental well-being on the y-axis and the amount of time that young people spend in a given uh, screen media um, on the, uh, the x-axis. So TV and movies, video games, computers, smartphones, it doesn't seem to matter which one it is exactly a little bit, an hour a day is actually associated with a positive change. But after that, it seems to plateau. And once you get past two or three, what you see is this downward slope, that the more time kids are spending in uh, screen media, the less mentally healthy uh, they are. So why might that be? Why might um, uh, these both be, be uh, positive in, um, in moderation, but uh, a big negative in, uh, in excess. And of course, most of the kids that we see, most teens are really more down this end of the spectrum uh, and, and far away from this. But all right, so we wanna talk a little bit about the good. What are the good things that come out of all this time kids are spending on screen media? And those are displacement, cognitive skills, and social support. Perhaps the best thing, about uh, all the time young people are spending, and, and adults for that matter, on, on screen media is all the time they're not spending doing risky behaviors. And I'm talking about the kind of stuff that kept my parents awake at night uh, when I was a teenager in the 80s. We're talking sex, violence, unsafe driving, drug and alcohol use. These are all the things that kids are not doing nearly as much as they did before the tech revolution. So um, teen pregnancy, for example, uh, has really plummeted. Uh, it's half of what it was in the 1990s across demographics in America. So it may be that, that their um, kids are sending each other pictures, but nobody's getting pregnant, right? Uh, violent crime, for all the concern about the effects of violent video games, and, and there is good reason to be concerned, violent crime has actually plummeted uh, in, the, uh, in the United States among adults, but also among kids and teens. Um, it is less than, what is it, a quarter of what it was in its peak in the 90s, and it stayed uh, low for, um, uh, for a number of years. So again, kids may be shooting each other on Call of Duty, but not, uh, not in the real world. Uh, motor vehicle traffic uh, deaths among teens have out plummeted as well. Uh, just since the year 2000, after a big plateau in the 90s, um, uh, the, the number of, um, of teens who die in auto accidents has decreased by more than half. And most of this, of course, is because teens aren't getting their license uh, because they're not so interested in driving, but this is a very, very positive uh, outcome. Uh, drugs, alcohol, and cigarette use is also down. Um, alcohol, and this is past month use of uh, these um, uh, various substances of abuse by teenagers. And you can see that alcohol use has declined by nearly 50% just since the year 2000. And cigarette use has declined by more than 50%. Now, I do have to say this ends in 2016. It doesn't quite take the vaping craze into account. So, uh, so we don't have that data yet. But even marijuana use, um, you know, for all the concern about legalization, is less among teenagers now than it was in the year 2000. There's also um, evidence that prescription drug use is falling among teens as well. So again, we may look at evidence that teens may be becoming addicted in some ways to their devices, uh, but not to drugs and alcohol, not in nearly the numbers that they were. So um, I want to focus on a little bit on video games when, when again, when, um, when young people are playing video games, they're not just passively assuming con um, you know, consuming content, they're actively engaged. Their brains are engaged and they are learning um, uh, as they go. Um, what kind of things are they learning? What kind of skills, what kind of abilities are they training? Um, well, I, I do want to say uh, before I get into popular video games, that educational video games can be very, very effective tools for 
teaching. Um, uh, they, 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 they do work well. And, and certain games have been shown to help um, teach skills of diabetes control or help with um, coping skills for depression. Um, uh, of course, these games uh, are nowhere near as popular as the games that are just played for enjoyment. And they're, um, uh, the, um, uh, the budget of these games is roughly one one thousandth of you know, some of these big budget games. So not nearly as popular, but they have great potential. But regular, you know, um, um, video game play, uh, Fortnite or Call of Duty is training a lot of skills. And those include, of course, eye-hand coordination. Um, gamers are better than non-gamers and non-gamers can improve by playing video games. Uh, but did you know that video games also have better vision? Um, that they all are better able to pick out small details. And of course, this makes sense because they're constantly scanning the screens to pick up these small details that might make the difference with, between life or death for their avatar. Gamers also are better at contrast sensitivity. So take a look at these dots. Can you tell which one is a different color than the others? And the answer is, uh, yes, you guessed it. The answer is this one here. Gamers are better at this than the rest of us, but we can improve by playing video games. Again, another um, visual skill. All right, here's a tough one. Uh, we see here, number one, we're gonna test your mental rotation skills. Number one uh, is the same as A, B, or C. Take a look and imagine if you can mentally rotate it and see which one it um, is identical to. So the answer is actually A. Um, and when I, uh, I'm not gonna, I didn't ask you guys here, but when I'm in large groups of people, usually about a third get it, um, get it correct. And very often they're the gamers. The gamers are better at this than uh, the rest of us. Visual tracking objects, especially on the periphery of their vision, uh, gamers do it better than the rest of us. Multitasking. Now, multitasking is a little bit of a myth in multiple ways. First of all, our brain cannot do two things at once. What it can do, however, is it can rapidly shift from one task to the next. And that's really what multitasking is. And in general, multitasking is an awful, awful cognitive uh, strategy because you lose so much um, in the transition back and forth in terms of your efficacy. Um, and teens are generally nowhere near as good at, as good at this as they think they are. That said, gamers are better at it than the rest of us. And they're typically managing multiple different things at once. How much ammo they have, where's the enemy, where's the cover, where's my friends, all these other things. Working memory. Um, gamers are better able to memorize um, telephone numbers, for example, or have a longer digit span. Um, and again, they are using their working memory in games. Okay, so take a look. This is a test of visual attention. This is called the Stroop test. Take a look here go through each one and try not to focus on the word, but instead register what the color of the font is. So here we have blue, green, red, purple, um, uh, orange, purple, that kind of thing. Gamers are more efficient at this task than uh, the rest of us. Okay, so gamers have better eye-hand coordination, better vision, better visual attention. Um, they are multitasking well they must be better drivers than the rest of us, right? Well, there are a few studies uh, that looked into this, and unfortunately, they found that gamers might be more skilled, but they're actually less safe drivers than non-gamers, even when you control for baseline impulsivity and risk-taking as a personality trait. And it's easy to think of, it's easy to imagine why that might be. Video games reward risk-taking. When you're playing, and when you're playing Grand Theft Auto, if you crash your uh, your car, it's going to be maybe a few seconds at, at most for you to be able to go and get another one or reset to one earlier. And, and so, so gamers actually, this translates to real life. They take more risks driving than non-gamers. Um, so unfortunately, um, gamers might be more skilled drivers, but not safer. So this really calls into question that, that video games do teach these skills in a very real and measurable way but what is the, what's the utility in our regular everyday lives? That is not quite as clear. 
uh, behavior uh, um, uh, currency. Video games also are a, a great form of motivation as, um, as other form of screen time. Um, uh, that uh, if you want to get you know a young kid to do his chores, just hold off the screen time until uh, he's done. And I think parents shouldn't be afraid to use uh, um, screen media in this way. Uh, social media, um, of course, most teenagers use social media to connect with their friends, um, keep contact with their friends, and to make new ones. Um, and a certain type of, um, and for, for most teenagers, uh, social media use actually does increase a sense of self-esteem and support. And this is usually teenagers who have friends um, uh, in real life, right? The more friends they have in real life, the more likely they are to be successful on social media and get the same uh, type of reinforcement, but also those who have a more active um, use style. So this is kids who are posting, kids who are liking, kids who are commenting, not so much kids who are scrolling and lurking. Um, kids who, have, uh, who do that, who have less friends in the real world actually tend to feel less um, uh, self-esteem the more time they spend on social media because they tend to get more negative um, uh, feedback from their peers. Um, but social media can all be really uh, very invaluable for minority youth. And this could be racial minority, but also could be religious minority or, um, uh, or those with learning disabilities or just those with a very niche interest. Um, kids with autism can find um, like-minded peers online when sometimes they cannot uh, in, um, uh, in their everyday lives. Okay, so let's look at the bad. The best thing about, um, about uh, screen media is the displacement effects, and the worst thing is the displacement effects as well. But we also want to talk about some of the negative content and experiences and how they can affect um, uh, young people. So in general, um, you know, screen time is strongly li linked to depression and unhappiness. Um, and it's a pretty, you know, again, pretty powerful relationship, especially once you get past, you know, uh, those who are just engaging a little bit. Um, but it also has been found to link to behavior problems, low self-esteem, and poor physical fitness, literally in hundreds of studies. This effect size isn't as small, but, but quite significant. I'm sorry, it is smaller, excuse me, but still quite significant. All right, so um, with the rise of screen media use in the lives of young people, we've seen a, a concomitant explosion in rates of depression and anxiety. And, and since the release of the iPhone and the PlayStation 3 and the, and the new Xbox, um, we've seen uh, a near doubling of rates of self-harm and suicide presented, um, present, teens presenting for treatment of these issues. And the, unfortunately, the, the suicide rate among teens, which had been decreasing for 15 years in a row, has been increasing steadily since that time. And again, those who spend the most time online are at the greatest risk. And there is some alarming evidence that this bump we've seen in screen media use with COVID has also been um, accompanied by a significant increase in uh, depression, anxiety, and suicidality as well. So I mentioned that the, the, the biggest issue, um, the biggest problem with screen media is the biggest negative effect is um, displacement. It's opportunities lost. All this time, this you know, eight hours a day or more, you know, depending on, on the person, spent on screen media entertainment, it doesn't come from nowhere and it doesn't come for free. Um, the kids are missing out on on learning life skills, on socializing in person, um, on extra, on physical activity and exercise, on being outside, on activities with academic value, um, uh, different activities, um, having sort of a variety of different hobbies, and maybe most important of all, sleep. Um, I mentioned before that uh, young people are in no rush to drive uh, these days, that, that the percentage of uh, 12th graders who um, are getting their license has really plummeted uh, in recent years. So that's a skill, again, they're safer, um, but it's a skill that they're, they're putting off. They're also getting together in person significantly less than they ever have uh, before um, and uh, missing out on this important time to develop social skills that really can't be developed on, on, um, on texting. Uh, and, and, and experiences, and they're not dating um, as much as well. Uh, again, learn, missing out on, on important experiences and practicing. 
Um, the young people are also spending less time um, uh, in physical movement and exercise and less time making healthy diet choices the more time they spend on screen media, which is one of the biggest reasons for another 30% uh, increase in rates of obesity among, uh, among young people since uh, the year 2000 and a, a similar increase among youth. I'm sorry, this is in the United States. Um, and in my lifetime, we've really experienced the near death of reading for enjoyment among teenagers. Um, in the, uh, you know, back, way back in the 70s, the percentage of teens who said they read daily for fun, um, you know, was, was about two thirds. And that has plummeted to maybe 15% uh, in recent years. So, um, uh, and of course, um, the not reading uh, for enjoyment, um, there's a great deal that's lost in terms of the ability to focus, in terms of delayed gratification, and in terms of, uh, of, of reading skill. Um, also, young people are engaging in fewer um, uh, other hobbies uh, than ever before, in terms of sports, in terms of um, musical um, instruments, in terms of chores. Young people, are, um, studies show doing less chores than they ever have before. Um, and, uh, um, and other activities um, are um, other activities that have a value and, and, and opportunities to learn. Their worlds are really shrinking in a way that, um, uh, that unfortunately um, uh, is unhealthy. But maybe the biggest uh, displacement effect and the most important and oftentimes the most sort of underappreciated is the effect on sleep. Sufficient sleep is vital for, uh, for good health. Um, for example, it's crucial for learning. Um, the most important factor in how much you're going to remember about what we talk about um, uh, in this hour uh, may depend less on whether you're taking notes or something like that, but, but actually more on how you sleep tonight. Um, because sleep is when memories from the day are consolidated into long-term memory. And if you don't sleep well, you won't learn well. But sleep is also protective against uh, obesity strongly uh, and against depression, anxiety, and, and suicide. Um, and oftentimes the best thing I can do for my depressed and anxious teen patients is to get them a good night's sleep. And the best thing I can do for that is to get the screens out of their bedroom, although they don't thank me for that, at least not, not immediately. Um, but the biggest reason that, that uh, screen media is related to poor sleep is displacement. Young people want to stay up later than they ever have before. Uh, when I was a teenager, you know, unless you liked Arsenio Hall or Johnny Carson, there wasn't that much reason to stay up late. These days, the whole world of entertainment is at their, is at their fingers. And, and, um, and young people enjoy staying up late because it's the time they're going to be supervised the least often by uh, their parents. Um, but also, uh, young people are very often engaging in screen media in bed. Um, and especially social media, but often video games on iPhones or iPads. And this causes another problem with sleep via deconditioning. The more time you spend in bed doing exciting things, the less uh, likely you are to be conditioned to your body knowing that the bed is a place for sleep and to get to sleep quickly and to stay asleep. So even when kids do turn off the screens, uh, their, body may, their bodies may not be ready to stop the excitement. And part of that, um, uh, another part of that effect is the effect on arousal. Playing um, action video games, going on social media, it increases your blood pressure, it increases your pulse. There, it's exciting. And studies show that after playing a video game or being on social media, it actually takes two and a half times longer to fall asleep than if you were reading a book or even watching a television show. And this again is because of the arousal effect. So even after kids turn off these screen media, it takes longer to fall asleep. And finally, the blue light from screens does um, have an effect and disrupt circadian rhythms. Um, and that of course is our body's sleep-wake cycle, making um, uh, the, the brains of young people think that it's the daytime when it's the nighttime. And teenagers are especially vulnerable to this effect because adults have a 24-hour sleep-wake cycle. Teens have a 25-hour sleep-wake cycle, which is why that, that, that left to their own devices, so to speak, they'll stay up later and later and then sleep later and later. So especially vulnerable to this blue light effect in the evening. So screens are really the enemy of sleep for a lot of young people, which is the, probably the biggest reason we've seen this explosion of insomnia. So this is the percentage of 
um, of teenagers who get less than seven hours of sleep on most nights. Now, teenagers really need eight to 10 hours for optimal functioning. So this is significant. This isn't just mild insomnia. This is significant um, uh, sleep deprivation. It's gone from 25% in the 90s to, uh, to 40% um, uh, a few years ago. Um, so uh, another sort of, uh, and, and, and this is something that kids are often unaware of how important sleep is for their well-being. Also, um, the, the, the effects of screen media on the brains of young people is especially important because the, the brains of young people are not finished. They're still developing. Um, and what happens, the biggest, uh, the best way I can describe development of brains is not that young people are making more connections or that their, their, their brains are growing. They're not, actually they're shrinking. Uh, we have the most brain cells we're ever gonna have when we're born. Well, the, the maturation process really has to do with pruning. Um, so it has to do with de deleting the areas that are redundant or aren't needed. So, um, uh, and the areas that are used the most are myelinated, which is almost like a highway being set down to make them really fast and efficient. And, um, and so, it is so vitally important, the experiences that young people have, because the areas of the brain that they engage in are ultimately what is gonna be left over um, when the maturation process is done. For example, if you were to blindfold uh, uh, an infant for a short period of time um, uh, in their infancy, they would miss this developmental window and that part of their brain would be pruned and they'd never be able to see even after the blindfold is taken off. So it's sort of a use it or lose it um, uh, type um, of situation. And there are certain parts of the brain that you know, control motor learning, certain parts of the brain that control social interaction. And if young people, again, are not having these uh, variety of experiences, um, uh, these parts of the brain are going to uh, be, be, uh, be pruned in a way that they'll never be able to recover. So um, along this line, the National Institute of Health looked at the MRIs of 4,000 kids. And they found that not only did those who had high screen exposure have more aggressive behavior, which we, we knew, but they also saw a deterioration of the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that exhibits control over your behavior. So these parts of the brain were, um, uh, were simply not developing or were, um, or were being um, uh, uh, pruned. And in those who had the most screen exposure, they saw the, the biggest effects on the brain. They actually saw a diffuse thinning of the entire cerebral cortex. And essentially, the whole brain went through this thinning process more early than is typical than their peers who didn't spend so much time on screen media. So, um, uh, so you know, my mom always told me if I spent too much on TV, it would rot my brain. And it, it almost seems like something like that um, may be happening for those who spend the most time on screens. Okay, I want to move on to violent video games. There's a lot of concern over the years about the effects of violent video games. This subject has been the, um, uh, a subject of controversy in, in media, and I think really it probably shouldn't be. There's a, a couple sort of very opinionated um, researchers who really stand apart from the vast majority of studies, which essentially show the same thing. And that is that violent, and, and this is you know, more than 100 studies that show over the short term, over the long term, in young people, in, in um, young adults, in kids, video games do desensitize to violence. They do increase aggressive thoughts. Um, if somebody brushed up against you, did he mean to do it on purpose to bother you? Or, you know, or, um, you know, what would you do if somebody, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, was insulted you? They, they do increase aggressive thoughts in the short term and the long term and aggressive behaviors. Now, I didn't say violent behaviors. Violence is rare and it's really hard to study, but aggressive behaviors. They decrease sh um, pro-social thoughts and behaviors like sharing and that kind of thing. Um, so this is, the vast majority of researchers uh, have found the same thing, that, 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 that the effect is, is fairly indubitable. That said, the effect isn't big, okay? So, so violent playing Fortnite is not going to turn a nice, well-adjusted kid into a sociopath, um, you know, but if there's a spectrum, um, then, then video game play does nudge people along, uh, uh, along that path. So there absolutely is an effect, but it is a, a relatively uh, small effect size. 
pornography. Um, studies show uh, that um, most teens are uh, exposed to pornography and that parents vastly underestimate whether their teens have seen porn and how much porn they have seen. One study looked at actually had the, the parent-child pairs come in and the only half of the teens who had seen porn did their parents think they had seen it. And the amounts that the parents thought they um, had seen of those who knew that they or that, that were correctly guessed that their kids had seen porn, um, it was off by a factor of 10. 10 they, they guessed about one tenth of what their kids had uh, reported. And so for many young people today, um, you know, especially since uh, um, uh, sex ed is not, not mandated in most um, of, uh, of the states of our country and scientific um, education is only mandated in a very small number, Pornography has become, like it or not, the, the de facto sex ed for a lot of young people, and that has good and bad implications. Um, pornography use has been demonstrated to shape sexual attitudes and behaviors. Um, so, for example, young people who engage in um, porn are more likely to um, view casual sex, um, you know, uh, more positively. Um, they are more, they're less likely to use condoms. Um, and uh, although interestingly, so more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior. That said, studies also show that if the parents talked about sex uh, with their kids, it actually, then this relationship actually went away. So parents are very, very powerful, more powerful than they know in their ability to protect kids from sexual uh, behaviors, uh, risky sexual behaviors. Okay. Sexting, also more common than we think. Um, recent studies have found that most young adults when surveyed admit that they, that they um, uh, sent naked pictures when they were a teenager. Um, it's not, not, not far above 50% but it's most, it's becoming a normative uh, behavior. Um, of course, predicted by unsupervised internet access, and it does have a relationship. Young people who sext are more likely to engage in unsafe sex and depression, although the cause effect relationship of this is not as clear as the pornography relationship. Um, we don't have um, uh, data to show um, what, the, what, what the cause and what the effect is. Most teens who engage in this behavior say that they don't really have any consequences, nothing good or nothing bad. They don't necessarily feel closer. Uh, and I should say most teens um, who do this send these pictures in the context of an already existing relationship. So I sent my boyfriend a, uh, a picture. And usually they don't end up feeling better about themselves or more close to their uh, boyfriend, but neither do they usually end up feeling worse or having the picture passed on or anything like that. Now, there are a subsection of teens who engage in risky sexting. And risky sexting is sexting outside the context of a pre-existing relationship. And this is usually, if you send me a pic, then I'll be your boyfriend or your girlfriend or, or whatever. And LGBT youth are especially prone to sexting in this way um, and are more likely to have the negative consequences, which is often feeling worse about yourself, relationship doesn't pan out, the picture gets passed on to other people, that kind of thing. Uh, Cyberbullying, of course, the more time the young people are spending online, the, the higher um, the rates of, uh, of cyberbullying. And cyberbullying, of course, isn't just being mean to someone online. It is intentional cruelty done repeatedly where there's a power differential, usually the popular person, you know, who is uh, being cruel to the unpopular person. Um, and, um, and naturally, the anonymity of the internet um, uh, makes this worse. Sites that, that uh, have anonymous, you know, postings um, are often a haven for cyberbullying because people think often rightly that there won't be any consequences. Um, and lack, to face to, lack of face-to-face -face interaction also contributes because um, very often people are more cruel than they would normally be because they don't see the reaction of the person they're being cruel to. Um, very, uh, again, becoming more common. 59% of teens say they have been victim. 20% say they've been perpetrators. Girls are more likely to be both. Girls are more likely the victims, but they're also more likely the perpetrators as well. And involvement as either a perpetrator or a victim increases likelihood of depression and suicidality. Um, and actually those who engage in both the bully victims, who are, are victims themselves, but also engage in bullying of others, um, are the, the worse off uh, mentally. 
okay, we finally get to the ugly um, addictive uh, habits. Um, so what is an addiction? Well, addiction is an excessive pattern of compulsive or uncontrollable behavior, which leads to big problems in your life, impairment in multiple domains and associated symptoms, which we'll talk about in a minute. Technically, any behavior, of course, we think about addictions, of course, with substances uh, of abuse first, and, and rightly so. Uh, that said, any uh, behavior can technically become addictive if it's sufficiently reinforcing. Um, so uh, there's some reports that are theoretically social media can. Um, pornography um, is something that um, there's significant evidence that uh, excessive pornography use um, can uh, mimic a behavioral addiction. Of course, online gambling uh, certainly is a um, is the only sort of universally recognized behavioral addiction. Um, but the most evidence besides gambling is actually with gaming. So we're going to talk a little bit about gaming again, because again, that's where the evidence is. Uh, I was going to show you a video here, but I haven't quite figured out the video thing. Um, but we'll, 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 we'll get to that. This is uh, Cam Adair on the TED stage talking about his video game um, addiction. But, <laughs> but gaming disorder, again, is this pattern of excessive play. Um, it causes significant distress, significant impairment. So socially, you're not doing as well as you were academically you know, that, uh, that kind of thing, and, and additional symptoms that go along with it. And essentially, these are the same symptoms that we use to define uh, addiction to drugs or alcohol or gambling, <laughs> but we'll talk a little bit about them in turn. Um, you don't need all of these symptoms, but you need a number of them. So uh, number one is you spend more and more of your time uh, playing, so it dominates your free time. Number two, when you're not playing, you're preoccupied. You're thinking about the game constantly. Number three, you've lost interest in other hobbies. You don't do sports anymore. You don't get together with friends anymore. All you do is play the game with your free time now. Or unfortunately, in the case of a lot of young people that I see today, they just never developed any other hobbies. Withdrawal. Uh, when you can't play the game, you become irritable or dysphoric. Number five, uh, you've lost control. You can't cut down. These are kids who come home from school and say, all right, I'm gonna play Fortnite for an hour. Then I'm going to get to that homework. And, uh, you know, uh, four hours later, you know, they're still on the game. So loss of control. Uh, continue despite knowledge of psychosocial problems caused by your use. So your parents are on your back. You, you know, you're, you're, you, you're the only one of your friends who isn't dating. Um, you don't get together with friends anymore. That kind of thing. Lies. Um, addicts lie. It's part of the process. And oftentimes I interview um, adolescent boys with their parents. And when I do, I often ask, you know, so how often do you play this, this CSGO or whatever the game that they're telling me about? And, you know, they'll look at me straight face and say, oh, you know, maybe an hour, two hours a day. And then their parents who are sitting across the table confront them on the fact that it really is three or four times that. Um, and usually you can tell pretty quickly, you know, with these things, uh, situations, who is uh, being dishonest. Interestingly, when I interview little kids, I get the opposite, where, um, you know, the, the parent will say, oh, little Jimmy, he doesn't play any of that Grand Theft Auto, and he's always off by seven o'clock at night. And then little Jimmy looks at her and says, mom, I was playing when you went to bed uh, last night. I was playing uh, uh, Mortal Kombat, but, but lying another symptom of, uh, of gaming disorder. And um, uh, number eight, um, the habit threatens or causes the loss of a relationship or educational opportunity. And what I most commonly see um, is a progression where young, um, usually boys, um, will, uh, they'll, they'll be doing okay at school, but when they get home from school, they play video games all the time and they don't do their homework and they often stay up late. So after a while, they're tired when they get into school, they haven't done their homework and they're, you know, so they're cognitively, they're not working as well. Um, and they start to fall behind at school too. So they start to fail. So as a result, they become more upset about the real world. They become depressed and they're more dependent on the game as a way to escape. So they end up playing the game more. Um, and often I'm times end up playing the game all night. So, so the next step is often that um, they're failing at school and they're exhausted in the morning because they're up all night playing video games. So, so they start to refuse to go to school because why bother? I'm failing anyway. Um, and this is oftentimes when they come to see me. 
Um, and number nine is a play to alleviate negative mood. Just like with a drink of alcohol or, um, or playing gambling, doing some, uh, playing video games to, to improve your mood, there's nothing wrong with that unless it's your only means of improving your mood, unless it's the only thing that makes you feel better. And oftentimes with addicts, that, that is the case. Okay, so who is the most likely to get, um, to develop this addiction to video games? Well, when young people are followed over a period of years and they don't have a video game addiction at the start, but they develop it two years later, um, they look at who develops it, it's most likely boys, and boys do play about twice as much uh, video games as girls. Um, often kids with poor social skills, like kids on the autism spectrum, kids who are emotional or impulsive, like kids with ADHD, and there's something about video games that is especially um, appeals to kids with ADHD and captures their attention like nothing else. But also uh, young people with a poor relationship with their parents and whose parents don't monitor their screen use as much and those who spend the most time gaming to begin with. So playing, you know, spending six hours a day playing video game doesn't mean that you're a video game addict. The difference is that some people can turn it off when it's time to do something else, but it does make you more likely to develop an addiction. Um, so uh, there's no blood test to see if you are um, in addicted to drugs or gambling, but we know there are reliable changes in the brain structure and function that go along with addiction to drugs and alcohol and gambling for that matter. And dozens of studies have shown that the same um, or very similar abnormalities happen in the brain of, um, of uh, video game addicts. I see Lori O'Neill has raised her hand. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly able to take a uh, question if that's possible. Pat, are you able to unmute Lori? Maybe I can do it. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Lori, I think you can unmute. Oh, sorry, my ask to unmute button isn't working. Um, oh, I'm afraid we might have to go forward. If uh, Lori, if you can jump on, that's great. Otherwise, we'll make sure to, to get your question at the end. Uh, all right. Um, when video game addicts are followed over time, they're more likely than their peers to develop new onset problems with insomnia, of course, with school failure, as I mentioned, with worsened family relations. So um, things often go from bad to worse with their uh, families and actually decreased supervision. So what I think my interpretation of this result is that families just give up. Um, and with depression and anxiety, especially social anxiety. The more times kids are spending on, um, on video games, the more anxious they get about real world uh, interactions, especially with their peers. So um, what, are, what, what, are, what can parents do about it? What can family do about it, um, all this? Well, I do think, especially for young kids, uh, the, but um, the most important thing is instilling a, a routine. Um, screen media can so quickly gobble up every bit of free time that, um, that, that, um, uh, that kids have if they're allowed to, um, especially for certain kids. Um, so setting up a daily schedule that allows for enough time. You guys have seen the, uh, the food pyramid. This is my uh, uh, daily habit uh, pyramid. So uh, a sufficient time for sleep, so important every night of the week, not, not you know, a small no amount on weekdays and catch up on the weekends. Um, enough time for school, for schoolwork, for chores, for homework. Enough time for meals, for self-care. Enough time for physical activity, for family time and social um, time, and maybe reading for fun. And sort of what's left over there when, you know, when kids are engaging in a nice, healthy balance, is, is fine uh, to engage in screen media. Now, there are some who are so engaged in their screen media that even just a little bit a day, they'll obsess about for the rest of the day. And for them, sometimes abstinence is the only thing. But, uh, but again, finding, you know, um, uh, finding that healthy balance is the most important thing. And, and kids need, uh, typically need adults to uh, make sure that happens. Studies show massive protective effects of parental monitoring. The more time parents spend monitoring the, sc uh, the screen habits of kids, the less, light, the less time kids spend on screen media in general. This has the effect of increasing the amount of sleep kids get, 
lowering their risk for uh, obesity um, and their body mass index and improving their school performance. And, um, and also the less violent and inappropriate media uh, kids engage in, which seems to have the um, ripple effect of increasing pro-social behavior and decreasing aggressive behavior. So uh, not easy, of course, um, but, uh, but, but very, very uh, protective and powerful. So if I had sort of a top five list for what I wish for my parents uh, uh, and the things that I recommend, first is to have some limits for, for, for the time, the amount of time kids are spending on screens and the content, what they're looking at. Um, uh, it, it, it does make a difference. Uh, content does matter. Number two is grandma's rule. First, you do your chores, you do your homework, you do your self-care, then, you um, then you have time for, for screen media. Number three, no screens in the bedroom and no screens in the bathroom e um, either. When they're behind closed doors, parents can't, can't monitor them and screens in the bedroom are very toxic to sleep in multiple different ways. Number four, uh, encouraging po positive content. Of course, content does matter. Not, every, not all time spent on screens is the same. Um, spending time on a Zoom call with friends is not is, is different than um, than passively, you know, engaging in media. Spending time creating content, making music or art or something like that, um, it, 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 or or programming, it is. It does have value that um, that uh, the more typical forms of screen media engagement don't. Um, and of course, the painful one and the hard one is role modeling. The biggest determinant of child media habits is parent media habits. And um, studies show that when, um, uh, what many of us already know is that when we are distracted by our screen media, we do a lousy job as parents. And I know this from personal experience because I'll, uh, I'll be uh, playing a game or looking at something on my phone and my daughter will come up and tell me something and I'll say, mm -hmm, okay, I got it. And I think I do. But I don't, because five minutes later, I can't remember what she told me. Studies also show that parents are much more irritable um, with their kids, less likely to give them uh, positive uh, reinforcement, more likely to give them negative when they're trying to uh, multitask and, and on their screen media as well. Okay, so again, it's so important for young people to have a healthy variety of different activities for the growing brain, for their physical health, for their mental health. Um, you know, chores, exercise, family stuff, uh, family uh, games and activities, reading for fun, um, uh, you know, uh, gardening, youth groups, jobs, that kind of thing. Um, the more kids are doing this, the less time, the more they engaged, engaged they are in the real world and the less time and frankly interest they have uh, for, uh, for screen media. Uh, going outside, of course, important, but obviously this does not count. Um, when thinking about uh, parent parenting styles, um, two dimensions of parenting is how supportive parents are. Are you, are you really focused on yourself and kind of rejecting of the child? Or are you focused on the child and accepting them where they're at? And, and how demanding parents are of children? Are you expect a lot out of your kid? Or do you really, you know, do you really have lower expectations? And far and away, the most effective strategy is uh, the so-called authoritative style, where Parents expect a lot out of their kids and hold them to high standards, but also are accepting and child-centered. Um, as kids get older, it becomes more and more important for parents to be less of a cop um, with regard to screen media and more of a guide. Um, and the first steps towards this can be taken by inviting kids to make the, to, um, to make the rules with you, inviting kids to um, uh, you might say, look, I think, you know, 10 hours of video games a week is enough. When do you want them? Do you want them all on Saturday? Do you want an hour a day? What, what, what do you want to do? What's the, what's the time? And, and the more kids have some say in what the rules are and some flexibility over the rules, the more likely they are to follow them and to be thoughtful about their own um, uh, screen media habits. It's important to play video games with your kids uh, and teens and to watch shows with them as well. This isn't always as fun um, as we would like. Kids often beat us and, and like to uh, taunt us. It's a little healthy role reversal, right? With uh, them being the authority when we play uh, their games, um, but a, a healthy experience. And, and, and these experiences really allow us to understand more about what kids are doing and, and to be able to talk more 
about their screen media habits and help them to uh, have more critical thinking. So, so it's really important to maintain an open dialogue about screen media habits. This is easier said than done, of course. A lot of kids don't want to talk to their parents about what they're doing online. Why is this? Because they know the way that we're gonna respond. Um, and so that's why it's so important to bite our tongues when we have these discussions, when stuff comes out, for us to be curious and not judgmental. Because we, what we really wanna do, right, is to tell them the right answer and say, that is wrong, you shouldn't be watching that, that you, you should block that kid. I, I wanna see you do it right now. Um, however, um, if kids know we're gonna respond this way, they're, they're, they're much less likely to have this conversation. So what we want to do is show kids that we respect the way they think about them. And we try to guide them towards what we think is, is best, but, um, uh, but we show kids that we believe in their ability to make the right choice. And of course, this is much more doable and important in teenagers than it is in kids. Okay, resources for parents, a great book. If you wanna learn more about what we're talking about, I do recommend Juliana Miner's Raising a Screen Smart Kid. I think it's the best, she comes at it as a parent and gives a lot of great stories about her own experiences, but also she has a good understanding of the scientific literature. Um, Built-in controls on, uh, on any device, on the iPad, on an Android, on an iPhone, on an Xbox, on a PlayStation, they're there. Um, all of these devices can, uh, parents can input how much time they'll work on a given day, what hours that they'll operate, what type of media will work on them. Um, and these can make a huge difference uh, when the alternative is resting the controller away from our kids. Now, a lot of you are thinking right now, hey, kids can get around this. And you're right, they can. Um, that's why these uh, controls are not a substitute for um, traditional supervision, but they are a useful tool and they really can help. And in my opinion, no young person should ever receive you know, a, a telephone, you know, an iPhone or an iPad just unlocked as is. They should all start out with great heavy restrictions, which are slowly lifted over time as a kid develops and, and proves um, uh, their ability to handle it. Uh, there's also parental control software that can, use, that can work across different devices as well. But the parental control software is not as important as it used to be because, again, every device, even Windows, has parental controls um, that are often very, very useful. A great website, if you're not familiar with it, is Common Sense Media, which has all sorts of, of videos and advice about the types of topics we talked about today, but they also have a huge archive of um, every movie or video game or TV show where if you're not sure if it's appropriate for your kid or what it contains, um, this is the one for Fortnite, for example, um, you can look at what their recommendations are for age and what parents who use the, the website, you know, what age they think is appropriate and kids and kids get to uh, a review as well and what the elements of concern are in that uh, piece of media. So personally, when I am looking for a movie for my family to watch together, uh, this is often the first place that I check. They have lists for like Netflix or, or Amazon Prime or, or whatever, um, you know, best movies and, and, and by age of appropriateness. So, um, of course, as a parent, we don't have to be perfect. Um, uh, we just have to be uh, good enough, just like our parents were. So I hope I wasn't, um, uh, you know, uh, making um, uh, demands that seemed like they were unreachable. But we all have a time in our lives where we need help. Uh, quite frankly. And so if you find yourself in a position where you really feel totally unable to control your child's uh, behavior or media habits that seem to be detrimental to their uh, well-being or their functioning, if they're doing poorly in school as a result, or, um, or if they're developing, you know, behavior problems, or most importantly, if there's issues with safety. And oftentimes when I talk to parents, it seems like there's one in every crowd that says, hey, this sounds great, but you don't know my kid. If I tried to like restrict his Xbox, I think he would hurt himself or he would hurt me. And of course, um, uh, parents know their kids. And, uh, and, uh, and certainly this is something we see in clinical practice that oftentimes the kids that need limits the most, who are the most psychologically dependent on their um, on their device are also the least uh, are also the most likely to react with desperation if they are restricted from their device. So this um, is a sign that um, 
uh, that it, it's probably time to seek help from a qualified mental health professional. If you, um, if you, can, if you have a friend who can recommend one, that's great. Otherwise, going through your pediatrician uh, can be the best way uh, to go. So in conclusion, uh, screen media and habits greatly, uh, uh, habits and experiences greatly affect health of young people for better and for worse. In moderation, screen time can be safe, healthy, and enjoyable, but in excess, it displaces experience vital to growth and well-being. Um, and explicit content and unsupervised peer interactions uh, can be um, uh, unhealthy, even sometimes bordering on traumatic. Um, uh, and lead to terrible experiences. Some uh, kids and teens and adults for that matter do develop uh, a true behavioral addiction to uh, video games. Um, and parental supervision and guidance is challenging, uh, but it's protective and it's worth it. So that's, uh, that's game over for me, but, uh, but thank you very much for your attention. And at this point, I think we can open up for um, questions and comments. And everybody should be able to take themselves off mute if you have a question. I'm looking in our chat and I can, I can start with one or two of those. Okay. Um, uh, if you're giving this presentation again to another NAMI, please um, correct the name of National Alliance of Mental Illness. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Thank you very much uh, for that, that piece. Um, uh, looks like a, a, a typographical error there. Thank you. I will certainly do that. Um, another um, uh, question, dual desktop. Um, oh, I, I think, think I might have missed about your About your video that wasn't working. Yes, yes, and I, I apologize. But really, you didn't miss anything, just a bunch of kids cursing and, and attacking their parent. You probably didn't need to see that anyway this time of the evening. Um, uh, so could people who have these skills and abilities just be more inclined to be gamers? Yes, that's a great question. But for almost all of the, um, of the uh, abilities that I mentioned, studies show that non-gamers can improve their abilities with practicing video games. So these effects do not appear to be just that's why they're gamers because they're good at it. They appear to be um, at least in part an effect of their video game habit. So thank, that was a great question there. Um, so uh, is there, yeah, so uh, feel free if you have a, a comment or a, a question. <laughs> I have a question. Could you share with us maybe what initial treatment might look like for someone going in for help? Yeah, and so, and that really d does depend on, um, on the level of, you know, on, on what's going on with the kid, right? Um, and it can run the gambit. If a young person is in crisis, you know, where things have gotten to the point where they're threatening to end their life and, and, and um, uh, or, you know, they've been acting out violently, you know, and, and they're in acute crisis, sometimes the only thing is a, a short-term inpatient admission. Of course, that's a very, very small uh, percentage and, and, and not the likely outcome. But it runs the whole gambit down to, um, uh, down to sort of a weekly uh, meeting with a, with a psychotherapist, with a um, uh, child and family therapist who will work with, um, work with kids to, uh, to uh, figure out what, what, what they want and figure out how to communicate what they want with their parents and how to cooperate with their parents in order to um, achieve sort of a more uh, healthy uh, lifestyle and one that is going to help them reach their real world goals. Uh, somewhere in the middle, um, there are um, uh, partial hospital programs like the one that I work, the Joshua Center in Mansfield, um, where, which is essentially an after school group therapy program and that's for kids who really are having issues that are, you know, more severe than, um, uh, than just uh, something that uh, an outpatient therapy would be successful for, but who don't need like a, you know, um, a crisis uh, management. Um, also sometimes consulting a psychiatrist uh, like myself, um, even not as a therapist, but looking for medication management can sometimes be indicated. Studies show that in kids with ADHD and gaming addiction, for example, uh, treating the ADHD actually improves the gaming addiction. And again, there's something about ADHD that it, uh, the kids are especially susceptible to games. And when you treat it, they get better. Um, also in young people with depression and uh, gaming disorder, um, which they very often do go together, oftentimes treating the depression with medication can uh, improve 
the, the gaming habit as well. And using a medication specifically called Wellbutrin, which is a medication that helps um, decrease craving for cigarettes among uh, addicts, actually decreases, decreases craving for, um, uh, for video game play among addicts as well. So to add to that, what um, typical, maybe if, if you can say typical length of time to see improvement and success rate with treatment? Um, yeah, so um, the studies show that, um, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that treatment uh, is uh, usually uh, using cognitive behavioral therapy, essentially using um, techniques that are similar to what we use for other behavioral and substance use disorders um, are very effective for treatment of gaming uh, addiction. And oftentimes this involves family therapy um, because you know, very often, you know, loving, um, uh, caring uh, family members can be enablers, as we know sometimes, and helping them mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to respond in a way that's going to be uh, helpful in the long term, um, but also teaching skills and setting and keeping uh, goals um, uh, for the, the, the individual um, uh, gamer are important as well. Um, so most treatment um, studies are between um, like six and eight weeks. However, um, uh, I, I have to say with my personal experience, it really depends on what's going on with the kid. For example, I've seen kids who are very socially deprived. All they do is spend time on their, on their screens, but if they have a chance to connect with other kids in a way that they, know, that, that they feel that other kids actually respect them and they feel connected, they can blossom so quickly um, to the point where they don't they, they don't need their screen media as much anymore. I've also seen young people who are just so obsessed that they cannot stop talking about, you know, the video game, even, even when it's been weeks since they've, uh, they've seen it. Um, and there are for very, you know, there are some cases that are so severe that, um, uh, that, that young people, you know, become very uh, underweight. They they don't know they don't you know they don't engage in self care and and so there are actually residential treatment facilities for very you know for very severe cases. Um, mm -hmm. Although I haven't, but that's not the norm. What? Um, so my son's seventeen. Oh, and he loves his video games, and you can see it's affecting his sports. It's too bad. Good hockey player. He's not going out for a senior year. Um, grades have gone down. What's the best way to wean somebody off of that? Yeah, so um, uh, oftentimes I, I, I think the, the, the best way to kind of um, uh, to do that is, is first to have a conversation. How old is your son? 17. Yeah, so okay. So he's close to an adult. And, and where is he at? Is, he, is there any sort of, does he have any understand, any, would, he, would he agree with you or would he downplay it? Kind of both. He agree with me. Yeah, I'm addicted, but I still need to play. Yeah, it's, yeah. So uh, it's tough because, of course, you're um, and 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 how to be uh, how much to be a cop and how much to be a guide is really you know the, uh, the art uh, here. And and if he's unhappy with the way things are going, it might be um, uh, um, it might be that he would be you know willing to make uh, some changes like. And, and again, setting some parameters around the game use, I think is the most important. Uh, so if he's playing, you know, four hours a day, maybe the rule is that he, you know, he gets off at eight o'clock or the, or the best one that I've seen and, and a lot of families do is no games during the week and play all you want on the weekends. Um, and, uh, and play on the weekends uh, d does have less negative impact than during the week. Um, but uh, a complicated, um, yeah, so a complicated Question, but again, setting parameters around the around the use—that's usually the best place to start. And you can start small. You know, it doesn't have to be going from eight hours a day to to, to one. Yeah, and the, the hard thing is, his brother. His brother's an exceptional student. I mean, ninety-eight average senior math, even though he's senior honors math, even though he's a sophomore. You know, he's going to be National Honor Society. The other one, oh, just give me a video game. And it's uh, he's got the ability, but mm -hmm. it sits like a trash can in the corner. Yeah, yeah. It, it is amazing how some young people are just so more, so so more, much more engaged uh, by these games, and some of them can take it or leave it and have no problem 
turning it off when, when, oh. when it's time. Um, unfortunately, those who resist the you know, rules the most are oftentimes the, those who need it the most. Truth. Thank you. Great job tonight. Oh, thanks. Um, there's a question about, did you see the question in the chat uh, oh. about uh, how oh. many hours are okay when, chill, when your child has seizures? Mm. Um, so, um, so there have been certainly cases of um, certain types of games um, actually, actually initiating epileptic seizures, um, games with, uh, with bright flashes uh, in them. Um, that has been relatively rare, and I, I, um, I think is more limited to, um, uh, you know, particular cases than being a very common problem. Um, so in general, um, in general, I would treat a, a child with seizures in the same way as I would treat an, any other child, um, as far as their risks um, to uh, to excessive screen time. So, um, uh, you know, the uh, it's it's very hard to pin it down because, like um, you know, like Matthew had said, you know, kids are different, and and some kids can be on you know, a lot and they're fine. And some kids even just a little bit again, and they will sort of be obsess over it. So it really is hard to say. Um, but I would say like um, uh, for kids, um, just in general, um, for total screen time for entertainment, you know, during the weekday, if you can get it less than two hours, that's really great. And on the weekend, yeah, maybe it's not that important, you know, maybe, um, maybe uh, four um, and a little with a little more for teenagers. Um, the, uh, so, so when you get more than that, you start to see more problems in association with use in general, but again, all kids are different. Um, there's a couple, a um, couple questions have something in common in the chat box, uh, about which the positive, uh, video games that, that you would recommend for, for development of, uh, gotcha. And yeah. Yeah, so um, so you're right, and and they're not so easy to find. You won't walk into a GameStop and see some great educational games staring right back at you. You'll have to really uh, dig for them. But for example, like um, uh, Math Blaster is a game for for young kids where they have they really actually have to do math to to play the game, and and it's demonstrated that it works. Or um, I had my my daughter do a, a video game, you know, a typing game, um, and. I, she 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 types pretty good, you know. After um, after doing that for a while, um, what else? Um, uh, sort of struggling to uh, uh, to think here, and 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 not only uh, um, educational games, but games with pro social um, content actually have the opposite effect of violent video games. They actually increase pro social pro social thoughts and behaviors. So these are games where where the purpose is to help other people in nonviolent ways, you know, as opposed to a, um, a more violent game. Um, so, um, uh, so where to go to find, uh, to find these games? Um, oftentimes uh, your, your child's teacher will know um, of some, some uh, good games. And a lot of times they, they're used, you know, at school um, to help kids uh, learn. And sometimes kids will will be interested in playing them at home as well. Of course, um, many games are deceptive, right? Uh, CoolMathGames.com may sound like it's they're learning a lot of math, but most of the games they're not. So it is a challenge. Oh, and here we say, in what areas of development? Um, sorry, uh, Cassie Frost. Um, where do you find video games a great tool for development? Oh, okay. In what what areas? Um, yeah, and 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 it's not again. So it's not really clear. Again, video games have been demonstrated to have to, to improve these skills, but it's usually very unclear what the real world benefit of this is. But I can give you a, a, an exception. Studies show that um, uh, the biggest determinant of how well surgeons do on a surgery simulator um, that is used for training is uh, not the years of experience they've had and it's not um, where they trained, uh, it's how much time they spend playing video games. Um, so there's evidence that video game play, the eye-hand coordination, the multitasking, the, uh, the finesse and the visual skills may actually make a better surgeon. So something perhaps to ask your, uh, uh, your surgeon. I, I hope I answered your question. I, I don't, um, uh, yeah, video games can be very effective tools in teaching specific things uh, when they're built for that purpose. But um, 
But yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. Um, no, you did. Oh, great, excellent. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, I also see a question that says, uh, what what may be one of the coping skill games you mentioned? Okay, um, so one example of um, uh, of a game that teaches coping skills is Sparks, which is a role-playing game, a sort of World of Warcraft, um, set in a world that 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 essentially teaches cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and so you might be going through the swamps of automatic negative thoughts, and you have to use you know your uh, your coping skills to to move forward. And, there, and this is a game. Unfortunately, right now it's only available in Australia and New Zealand. So um, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, not currently uh, available in the U.S., um, but video games. Uh, what's another one? Um, yeah, sorry, that that's the one that that kind of jumps to my mind um, uh, as far as one that teaches coping skills. But um, there, for example, there um, there are um, uh, also video games that that um, uh, teach you know uh, um, kids how to use in inhalers for kids with especially for kids with asthmas. Asthma and have been shown to improve adherence to medication, um, uh, for example. Mm. Um, so here's one that says, we have a son age 16 who is clearly addicted. Would you recommend going cold turkey if the addiction is very strong or doing more of a taper? Well, I think if you can, um, if you can do it, a taper is certainly gentler. Um, a lot of times people find that the taper fails right? And that the only thing that they can do, it's just harder to do, right? And, um, and sometimes I have found, I mean, just in my experience, it, 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 it's, it's hard to recommend for your individual situation, but I've certainly seen cases where the Xbox goes out the window or get and gets, you know, or gets a hammer taken to it and life improves. That said, that can provoke a crisis. So, um, so you have to be really careful um, in how you go about that. But, um, but certainly, uh, cold turkey can be very effective, um, it, but of course the ultimate goal is to is right for us to teach our kids to be able to moderate their own use. So if you can get away, you know, if you can sort of you know uh, do a taper and uh, and work on 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 uh, decreasing it here and there, ultimately that that may be that may be healthier if you can do it. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, comments or, or questions? Yeah, I, I just had a general comment. I think the the loss of people just reading for pleasure and you know kids not being able to read very much and write well and communicate because there's just all this time with the laptop or the screen and they can't interact with other people, mm -hmm. you know, very well. I yes, think I, I think I I would throw out a comment though that in my own kids I noticed that they they are both very much lovers of audiobooks. Oh, okay. You know, I think, you know, whereas I find that a little, I don't I know, I'm not so much that I would rather hold the book and read a book, but it, it's just a different way to do it, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it might be more relaxing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It helps during a long commute, too, that yeah. audible. Yes. Yes, it, it certainly does. I do have to say, so that that is really wonderful. Um, uh, a word of caution um, is uh, with the the e-readers. I've <laughs> seen many, many of my patients get e-readers, and um, but I haven't seen any of them really do a lot of reading on them. You know, they often have access to the internet and uh, and games and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, uh, so very often the. Uh, the, what they're used for is oftentimes not what they're in, intended to be used for, but that's a way can, the parental controls can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume all this online learning doesn't count as screen time in the same way that gaming does, right? Yes, right, yeah. So all the studies I talked about were, were screen time for, um, uh, for, for entertainment. Um, education is in some ways similar and in some ways different, right? Well, so of course you're learning, you know, you're learning skills presumably. Um, uh, however, you know, the same problems can happen with lack of movement and lack of um, uh, exercise, especially if coupled by a lot of entertainment screen time, right? 
Um, so, uh, but 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 the studies that I that I cited are, of course, are almost all before uh, pre-COVID, and um, uh, and are really more uh, honing in on the entertainment screen use. Got it. Mm -hmm. I thought the stats that you quoted in the beginning about decrease in accidents with autos, et cetera, were pretty interesting when you see yeah. that information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one reason why us, we parents have conflicted feelings about our kids being on screens. We know that not only are they satisfied when they're on them, but they're safe too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and uh, Catherine uh, indicated that um, is an audio book in the bedroom okay if only used just for reading. Uh, yeah, I, I think absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, you know, it, it does depend. There are kids who even reading in bed they'll stay up very very late, um, and and sometimes isn't such a great thing, and and they do need lights out after a while. But um, uh, but if it's if it's accompanied with um, uh, you know, with getting to sleep uh, pretty well, then uh, that's great. I, I do have a lot of teenagers who, assu who assured um, myself and their, their parents that they only used the phone for music at night when they were in bed. And then when the screen time um, uh, um, app uh, came about and parents started getting information about what they were really doing at night, it was uh, um, a, a surprise. Um, so, you know, so, but, but that, if that's what, it, if you're able to make it so that it's just an audio book in the, in the bedroom, yeah, I don't think that that's going to, uh, uh, to cause this any, anywhere near the same type of problems. And general reading, of course, in bed is, 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 uh, is a good habit too. Mm -hmm. hmm. I guess, um, Catherine, I, the only comment I could make to your, your thing there, adding to Dr. Weigel's is um, out of experience with my own kids, when I want them to buy into something or, or make the choice I want them to make, I kind of usually give them two choices, which you, you did list there, cold turkey or tapering. And, you know, um, in addressing the issue with your son, you know, you know, so these, these are our options and what's, you know, where, where would you want to go with this? And obviously I think he would choose tape the tapering because that means he gets to do something still, but he gets that choice and sometimes giving them um, input into the solution um, it helps them to adhere a little bit better or at least buy in for the time being. Um, and, you know, and if, it, if tapering doesn't work, you do have the fallback of cold turkey if, if necessary, but um, just sometimes I used to, you know, as granted, my children were younger than 16 when I did a lot of that, you know, little manip psychological manipulation of giving them two or three choices, but what I wanted them to do was always the best choice than what that they would want. It was the most wanted choice, so that I always did what I wanted. <laughs> But, hey, well, it know, works it. really well. <laughs> but I have five kids, so I needed that. Um, but just sometimes making them part of the solution um, definitely increases your success, I think, as far as them buying into it. And even if you have failed moments, helping them, allowing them to help identify what happened or why did it happen? How can we do better? And creating the solution with you, not you just saying this is the solution. Just my experience. <laughs> Great point. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Cassie about the thoughts on the Yukon study of the, uh, about using video games and treatment for depression in adults. Hmm. Um, I am familiar. There is a, now a, uh, the first FDA-approved uh, video game treatment is actually for ADHD. Um, I am familiar. I don't know if any of you saw um, anything about that, but I was a little bit involved in development of this uh, this game, um, or at least in in the testing of of the game. Um, and essentially, it's a video game that uh, that that forces players to concentrate in order to move forward, like most video games do. Um, the, my issue with this game is the measure that they use to show that it was working is, a, um, is a, a, a test of visual attention that actually is a lot like the video game itself. So my concern, <laughs> if you've seen this video game, is that it rather teaches to the test 
and it's not really clear that it actually um, it actually produces a measurable change. Um, although the FDA was impressed enough uh, by the data to to give it FDA approval. Um, sorry, yeah, I, I I am interested in hearing more about one for depression. Yeah, I, I don't know about that one. I don't I don't either. I think they're asking for the name and title of the video. Oh, oh, the one for ADHD. ADHD. Oh, oh, the one for ADHD. Um, what do they call it? Um, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll have to. Um, it was called, uh, it, the name of it when I was involved had changed. It was called Project O, but they changed it. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll just pull it up. Uh, video game. Uh, treatment ADHD. You actually, I think you have to get a um, uh, prescription for, uh, for it. They're trying to, um, uh, they're trying to um, uh, sort of market it like a, uh, to have insurance companies pay, uh, oh, pay for it. Okay. I'm so sorry. I'll pull it up. Oh, Endeavor RX. Endeavor mm -hmm. Rx. Is that what they're calling it now? Let's see. Um, she put the link. She put Cassie put the yes. link. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, she got it. Yep. Yep. Um, and is, oh, here we are. Here's a link to the, um, uh, to the study. Gaming may de reduce depression in adult and older adults. Older adults. Older adults. Ah. Interesting. Older yeah, adults. Um, yes, I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds, uh, it sounds, it sounds promising. I have seen, uh, you know, I, I often give uh, talks, uh, you know, like this around the country and I meet all sorts of people who, who tell me about their personal stories, that gaming broke up their marriage or gaming caused these problems. And I've had a couple people that tell me that they have a problem with their, their, their own elderly parents who are up, you know, playing, um, uh, playing Facebook games, you know, uh, well past 3 a.m. in the morning. So, so we, we talk a lot about kids, but a lot of what we, you know, we talk about does apply to, um, to people of different ages. Um, so thank you for showing me the, uh, the study. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with it enough to have a, uh, to have a uh, opinion about it. Oh, someone wants to know if they can get a copy of the pyramid for teens, teen slide. Are you gonna make your slide deck available? Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, what I'll do, if it's okay, I'll I'll send that to uh, to Peg, and then um, okay. uh, and then if Peggy, you feel free to make it available. Okay. You know, one of one of the things that I do at NAMI is is take uh, phone calls from people uh, who are calling in at Wig, who are calling in with problems, and of course, our call volume has gone up tremendously with with um, COVID-19, people are anxious, they're isolated, they're depressed. And one of the things that, that we got from, uh, from NIMH is to recommend to people that they start to play video games if they're really feeling isolated and alone. So it, it went from you know, being a problem sometimes on a phone call six months ago to being a solution on some phone calls now. So yep. it's very interesting. Yeah, and of course the devil's in the details. You know, most people. I, I I hope I don't give the impression that video games are bad. You know, or that they're they're you know that they're 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 unhealthy for everyone. I I think that that many people who play play in a you know a way that is um, limited and and healthy and enjoyable and and absolutely you know uh, nothing wrong with it. For some people, they just they, it becomes too engaging though, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that I that I you know I worry about. So mm -hmm. you know, as part of a sort of a well balanced lifestyle, you know, video games can be great. Mm -hmm. Then we have Jessica's comment here. She's noticed as her son got older and played more video games that he doesn't have the patience or concentration that he has as, as a younger child. And could it be related? Is the constant action in games reducing his comfort with slower paced activities? Yeah, and I, 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 I think that, um, so th there is a body of research I didn't mention that, that points to, um, to engaging in, in um, that type of, um, 
you know, sort of rapid gratification, you know, screen media, including video games, mm -hmm. having a detrimental effect on the ability to focus. And, um, and I think that uh, um, uh, it, it's cer there's certainly some, some research to back that, uh, to back that up. And certainly, like, like she said, it makes absolute sense that, you know, that, that when we're playing games, we're not developing that sort of patience or the, um, or the ability to delay gratification and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it certainly makes sense. Um, and and uh, you mentioned a, a, a dopamine. Oh, so I must, yeah. Um, so and and with what happens in um, in gaming addiction, you bring up uh, a, a dopamine. Um, is that is that essentially in any addiction um, is that an experience that uh, that is uh, extremely pleasurable causes a massive release of dopamine in the pleasure centers of the brain, uh, the cingulate cortex and uh, the amygdala, and and the result is that if that's repeated over time, these areas of the brain get burned out. Right, um, so that they uh, have a, a down re regulation of postsynaptic receptors because there's always so much dopamine, you know, flooding the area. And so what happens over time with all addictions, um, including behavioral addictions, is that people lose pleasure in regular everyday things that they once enjoyed, um, you know, like seeing a friend or or getting a pat on the back or or a nice compliment. They need that massive rush in order to feel even a small amount of pleasure. Um, and, uh, um, and, and for gaming addicts, you know, oftentimes it is the, the video game, not, not pointing to your, uh, your son in particular, but, um, but that's sort of the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the dopaminergic process that has had the most research study about video games. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh. I don't see any more questions or raised hands. Um, Peggy, want to? Uh, like that? I, I, I think that's it. Um, <laughs> so you're going to send the, the PowerPoint presentation to me, correct? I will, yes. OK. And Pat, I think you've been recording. Yep, the, yes, so So um, for anyone who might want to go back and you know, catch something that flew by while you were, you know, had a moment's daydream or something. Um, you can go back and listen to the presentation again. It will be on the NAMI Farmington's Valley org website. Um, Dr. Weigel, we thank you very much for being here and staying on with us for our question and answer session and um, taking the time to share your wealth of information. Well, thanks really for, for joining Very good, me. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone else for, for coming in and, and spending your evening with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. It was very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Weigel. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Everyone's leaving. It's good to see you, Peg. <laughs> you too, Pat. You too. We'll have nope. to talk to you soon. Yep. Okay. Take it bye easy. Bye. Bye bye.